Hey everyone, welcome to session number three, Is There a Solution? We're gonna talk about the solution to the hurriedness in our life. Have you ever said this before? I need more time. I think one of the first times where I remember saying this was when we would take those time tests in elementary school where you try to answer the addition problems as quickly as you could and you'd have like a minute. And then the teacher would say, time's up, and I'd have a few left over and be like, I need more time. But I found something interesting. The older that I get, I don't stop saying this. I need more time. In fact, maybe I feel like I'm saying this even more often. Now it's, I'm saying, I need more time when I'm trying to hit a deadline for work. I say, oh, I need more time when I'm trying to finish a meal. I say, oh, I need more time when my wife and I are getting ready to go out on a date. What is it for you? I need more time. A lot of times we think that the reason why we need more time is because we're just so bad at managing our time. And we can really beat ourselves up over that. Like, oh man, I just, I just can't manage my time while I'm just, I'm just hopeless at this. I thought this was really interesting. This is from Dr. Devin Price, who's a psychologist and was doing some research with Loyola University. They found that their college students were having a really, really hard time with the way they spent their time. They were feeling burnt out, they were feeling hurried. And so after all this great research, do you know what the conclusion they came to was? You're not bad at time management. You're doing too much. Stop guilting yourself. And so I think that when we're starting to think about how in the world am I going to solve the problem of my hurriedness, the answer is not more time. You read about this in the book. The answer is not more time. If we had more time, we would just fill it with more stuff. There's one way that we could easily prove this. If you've got a smartphone, you could go ahead and look at how you spend your time on your phone. And one thing that I notice when I pull out my iPhone and it shows me my weekly hours and how often I've spent or how much time I've spent on my phone, one thing that I find really interesting is the most time I spend on my phone is when I should be doing nothing at all, when I should be going to sleep, when I should be resting, when I should be taking a break. When we have nothing to do, when we have that time, we just fill it with something else. We're really good at filling our time. So if we had more time, we would just fill it with more stuff. The problem is not that you're a bad time manager. The problem is that we're doing too much. So maybe we could stop feeling so guilty and beating ourselves up over it. I do find it interesting that when we look at this research and when the psychologists and the scientists are starting to make conclusions about how we're handling our time, it's actually only affirming what Jesus has been teaching us for thousands of years. It says this in Matthew chapter 11, and this is the uh, paraphrased translation from Dr. Eugene Peterson who wrote this in the message. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, are you tired? worn out, burned out on religion, come to me. Get away with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll live freely and lightly. What if you could get to the end of a day and you weren't feeling burned out? You weren't saying, I need more time, but actually you felt a sense of freedom and weightlessness. Well, Jesus is saying, Watch how I do it. Spend time with me and you'll start to see it. I think that if we're going to do this, we're going to have to reconstruct our entire understanding of time. Because that's the thing that we, uh, we sometimes mess up, isn't it? We start by saying, I need to work on my time management. But can you actually manage time? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Can you actually manage time? And the answer is yes and no. I mean, yes, you can determine how you're going to spend the time that you have. But the answer is no in that when you look at the actual definition of manage, to manage something is to be in charge of something. And the reality is you're not actually in charge of time. You want to try that really quick? I want you to go ahead and do everything that you possibly can to make these next three seconds slower than they actually are. Ready, set, go. Okay, that's completely ridiculous. We can't do it, can we? I just wasted three seconds of this talk. You cannot control time. And it's important that we realize that. It will help us in the way that we spend our time. See, I think that this is kind of why we think that pictures and videos are so valuable because they can do something that we can't. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is my sister, Christy, my brother, John, and that's me. This picture is from 10 years ago. A lot of time has passed since then. But I like looking at this picture because it reminds me of a really good time. We were gathering together. It was during my college years. John had just graduated from college. Christy was in college. And we met up at my sister's school and we went to a concert together. And I wish that I could freeze that moment in time, but I can't. I'm like jealous of what this picture is able to do to freeze the time, but, but I can't do that. Well, if I acknowledge that I can't do that, how will that change my time management? Not in the sense that I can control it, 
but in the sense that I can spend it. Maybe if I realized I cannot control time, I would instead value the person in front of me knowing that, well, I'm not gonna be with them every single second of my life. Perhaps it would make me more present. Here's the truth. You cannot control time, but you can choose your priorities. So in that picture, I had a great time with my brother and my sister and the time passed, I couldn't control it. And when I acknowledge that, in the time that I spend with my brother and sister, I might realize I'm not gonna be able to go back to this moment again, but I can prioritize them in this moment. I think that it would totally change the way that we spend our time. So what is it that you are prioritizing? Jesus has a thing or two to say about prioritizing as well. This is one of his most famous commands. This is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It says this, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Do this and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Now, I know that it's the Christian thing to say, okay, well, I want to seek the kingdom of God, but a lot of times we don't take the time to spend time with Jesus until we have more time to spend time with Jesus. Sometimes I wonder, like, do we actually have more space for that than I actually think? Like, I mean, I think that one way to solve our hurriedness is to acknowledge maybe there are some ways that I'm spending my time. Maybe there are some ways that I'm prioritizing things that are just really bad, really unhealthy. Um, tell me if you can relate to any of this list. I saw this. Here is how the average person will spend their day. So the average person will spend nearly three hours a day checking texts and emails. The average person will spend four hours watching TV or streaming services every single day, two and a half hours on social media, 96 minutes on the internet, 90 minutes in daily interruptions, 35 minutes deciding what to eat, 16 minutes deciding what to wear, seven minutes thinking about exercise, mind you, not actually doing the exercise, just thinking about the exercise, and well, you just spent one minute hearing this list. So, I mean, maybe we actually have a little bit more space in the time that we have than we think. So it's good to acknowledge that. But that being said, sometimes we, we really do just run out of time. So what does it actually mean to seek the kingdom of God first? Does it mean that we just shame ourselves and I just have to eliminate all the fun from my life? I can't have any leisure time whatsoever. I just always have to be working for Jesus, doing more. Well, no. And we know that that's not the truth because of how we see Jesus interacting with his disciples. I want to invite you to go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 6 if you've got your Bible with you. In this story, we're learning about the disciples who come back to Jesus from this great ministry tour. It says the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour. I love how it says that. It's their ministry tour. They're out and I don't know. I mean, you think about like the great concerts and tours out there that have uh, that have sold out. And I, I, I live in Ames. So I think about like Hilton Coliseum, like the disciples came in. And they just put on this great show for everyone. They're on cloud nine. And they told him all they had done and taught. Things had gone very, very well. They had spent their time in very wise ways. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. Isn't that interesting? I mean, this is opposite of how we handle things in today's culture. Oftentimes we say, hey, if things are going well, you need to ride the momentum. You need to keep going with that wave and pushing it. You need to keep on going while things are hot. Jesus said, hey, things are going well. Nice. Let's get away and let's rest. That's hard for us to do, isn't it? I've heard it said before that when our work is going well, our prayer life is not super great. It's when our work life is really struggling that our prayer life is going well. It can be applied to a lot of different places in our life. It's like when my family's doing really, really great, my prayer life isn't great. But when my, when my family's really struggling, well, my prayer life is awesome because I realize my need for God. I wonder if Jesus is telling his disciples, if you keep on riding this wave of momentum, you might start to think you're the one who's doing it. When things are going poorly, it's important that we take time to rest with God. When things are going well, it's important that we take time to rest with God. So that we remember who created us. Who's the sustainer of the good things in this world? Because I tell you what, if we keep on riding the wave and thinking that it's all our efforts, all what we're doing, well, that'll end just as well as any of the other times that we've believed that it's all our effort. It's all about the way that we are spending our time, and the way that we're managing our time. Jesus says, things are going well. That's good. Now's the time to go ahead and, and rest with me. This just totally reflects the manner in which Jesus lived his life. Did you know this is in the Bible? There was a moment where Jesus didn't want anyone to know which house he was staying in but he couldn't keep it a secret. This isn't the only time in the New Testament where Jesus retreats. He gets away from people. He takes time to rest. 
This is the son of God. This is the all-powerful, almighty, divine being, living, breathing in human flesh. And he saw the need to prioritize rest. It's not to say that Jesus doesn't care about people. It's that Jesus saw the need for rest. Jesus didn't feel this need to keep on pushing the momentum and always moving things forward. He saw time for rest. Now, this was really interesting, especially for a guy like Mark to write this. Mark was writing to people who were very obsessed with rushing things, with keeping things going, keeping things moving. He was writing to people who I think would probably struggle with something that we could call destination disease. Destination disease is I'm never comfortable with where I am. I'm always trying to get somewhere. I'm always on the move. I'm always pushing it. I'm always trying to make the most of every single second of my day. And Mark is pushing back with them. Throughout his, his gospel account, he even oftentimes uses the word immediately. And that would like totally relate to his audience. Immediately, immediately, immediately. And then boom, he has a moment like this where he says, Jesus got away. Jesus took care of himself. Jesus didn't wait for himself to get exhausted before he would rest. He would just simply get away. He knew when it was time for that. And this contradicts the way that we handle our rest. Oftentimes we rest from work. Jesus worked from rest. Okay, that's kind of a clever way of just saying it like this. We work to earn rest. Do you know what this is like? It's, I will rest when I do enough. I can finally enjoy my weekend if I hit all of my deadlines for this week. But Jesus worked from a place of rest. I wonder for you if when you get to your day off, you're just completely relieved. I desperately need this. But what if instead our day off, our Sabbath, rather than being something that we're just yearning for and needing, it could instead be something that we just receive and know that this is good. Jesus did not see the need to earn the rest. He worked from a place of rest. Let me tell you this. It is absolutely true that you do not have to work more to impress God to prove that you deserve a moment to rest. I think that it's so interesting that if your boss or your supervisor comes up to you in the workplace, they say, hey, what are you doing? Of course, you would never say, nothing at all. In fact, I don't even know why you, I don't even know why you pay me. I mean, I'm just sitting here. Because we feel like we have to hide our rest. We feel like it's just like this culturally wrong thing to say, I'm taking a moment, I'm breathing. We have to justify why we're resting. When we say we went on a vacation, it's, well, it was well-deserved, it was well-earned. Who cares if it was earned or deserved? God says you get it. God wants us to rest. When things were going very, very well and the momentum was something to ride according to what people say about momentum, Jesus said, take a moment and rest. We work to earn rest, but Jesus is inviting us to follow him, to learn his ways. And Jesus worked out of rest. So what does it look like to work from rest rather than working to earn rest? I think one of the things that we need to understand is we can be busy without hurrying. If you look at the life of Jesus, he was never hurrying, but he was busy. Like there's no doubt. Jesus had a very, very busy schedule, but he was not hurrying. Did you know this? Half of Jesus's miracles were interruptions. What does that mean? It means that even though his life was so full and your life might be so full too, Jesus was never in too much of a hurry to serve and love the person in front of him he would stop. There's this one story where there's a man named Jairus who walks up to Jesus. He says, Jesus, you've got to come save my daughter. She's sick and she's hurting. And as Jesus is on his way to go save Jairus' daughter, there's a woman who taps Jesus. She just grabs the, the tassel of his robe. And as Jesus is on his way to go save this little girl, he stops and he says, who touched me? And in that moment, he stopped and he healed this woman. And everybody's watches, oh, that's so tender, that's so nice, that's so wonderful. But how do you suppose Jairus felt? Jesus, you should be hurrying. You should be moving. Now, this story has a happy ending. Jesus would go and he would heal Jairus' daughter too. But what's the point here? Jesus was never in a hurry. Jesus had never double booked himself. Jesus was never running behind because he wasn't working to get to a place of rest. He was working out of his rest. Half of his interruption, half of his miracles were interruptions. He was never too hurried. Now, here's another one that you might recognize from your reading. To work from rest is to embrace our limitations. So often we think that our limitations are bad things. We live in a world where people say, if you're limited, obviously it shows you are finite and it shows that you can't do everything and, and, and that's a weakness. 
okay, yeah, by definition, to be limited means that I have weaknesses, but our limitations can absolutely be a gift. Just look at this from the beginning of the Bible. This is in Genesis chapter 1. God says to Adam and Eve, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What's God doing? God is setting up a limitation. God is saying, you are not designed to live outside of this space where I've given you good and long-lasting life. I've given you everything that you need in this space. And sometimes when we are going beyond our limitations, we're actually stepping into a place that's very bad for us. Even if the things that we're doing are by themselves good things. It's kind of like when we say, I'm just doing work for the Lord. I'm just doing everything I can. I'm pushing myself and going harder. I'm getting over involved. And then we start to forget things and we double book things and we show up late for stuff because we just got too much going on. It's when a good thing has become too much of a thing and we've stepped outside the boundaries of our limitations that God has said, I've created you to live in this healthy space. There might be good things out there, but that might not be the thing for you. What does your limitation do? Your limitation actually helps you focus on the purpose that God made you for. Not the purpose God made every single other individual for, but the purpose that God made you for. When we live within the limitation, we actually start to realize God's purpose for us. We get to work from a place of rest. We get to realize that we could be busy, we could have a lot going on, but we don't necessarily have to be hurried. We could realize that I don't have to save the world. I can have limitations and still be a follower of Jesus and live according to the purpose that God made me. And I think that this helps us realize this. The solution to our hurriedness, well, the solution isn't me. I think part of the reason why a lot of us are so hurried is because we think that we're the ones who have to save the day. I've got really good news for you. You don't have to save the day. Just after Jesus had been telling his disciples, hey, we need to go rest, we need to get away for a while, there's this crazy story that happens. It's one of the most famous miracles that Jesus ever performed. Maybe you'll recognize it just when I pull up this in Mark chapter 6. When Jesus saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. Jesus said, we need to get away. It's time for you to rest, disciples. And then Jesus sees a large crowd gathering around him. And he wasn't too hurried for them. Instead, it says he had compassion on them. It's this really beautiful word. It's splunk meets a my, which is interesting. It, it doesn't sound beautiful, but, but it is a beautiful word. That's, that's what it is in the biblical Greek. And it means compassion, but it's compassion at such a deep level that it actually moves you in your core in a way that could be described as heartbreak. It's this heartbreak that Jesus has for the people as they show up to him. It says that they're like sheep without a shepherd. They have no limitations. They don't understand where they're supposed to be living. They don't understand what's actually good for them. And Jesus has compassion for them. His heart breaks for them. Now, Jesus teaches them. He cares for them. He loves them. And then the disciples come up to Jesus and they say, Jesus, we've done enough. These people are really hungry. Send them home. I mean, it's been a really great conference. Keynote speaker, Jesus Christ, killed it. Amazing. And Jesus says, why don't we go ahead and feed them? Let's do this. And so somebody shows up to Jesus with very, very limited resources. Just a few fish and a couple loaves of bread. That's all they had. And it says this, taking the five loaves, excuse me, five, two fish and, a, and five loaves of bread. It says, taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and he broke the loaves. He broke them. He's doing the work to their problem, to what they need. And what's Jesus doing when he breaks the loaves? It reminds us, in order for us to be whole, something has to be broken, right? So in order for the bread to feed the people, the bread has to break and fill the people. For the people to be whole, the bread would have to break. Now, this is very interesting. This isn't just something that's symbolic. Like Jesus, of course, he, he broke the bread, he distributed the fish, and it's this incredible miracle. And as he breaks it, it multiplies and it feeds all these different people. Jesus is the one doing the work. He's the solution to the problem that's in front of them. But it's not just symbolic. It wasn't just for that one day. It's for all people of all time. At the end of Mark, there's this story where Jesus is sitting with his disciples for the last time at a meal. And it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take it. This is my body. See, there's another place in the New Testament where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I'm not just the bread for your stomach. I'm the bread for your soul. I'm everything that you've ever desired and needed at your deepest levels. And what's Jesus saying? He's saying, I will break for you to be whole. And he follows through on it. 
in John chapter 19, it says, One of the soldiers, as Jesus was on the cross, pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water flowed out. And what does that mean? As blood and water flowed out, it literally means that Jesus' heart physically broke. Jesus is the bread of life who would break so that we could be whole. I am not the solution to the hurriedness in this world. I am not the Messiah. I am not the Savior. I don't need more time to get things right because the solution is not me. The solution is Jesus. If I had all the time of eternity, I still couldn't get everything done that I want to get done because I'm not the one who can save myself. I'm not the solution. The solution is Jesus. And so I can rest with Jesus because I know that Jesus sufficiently loves the world and I'm a part of the world. Jesus is the solution. And Jesus is the one who cares about us. Jesus is the one who loves us to say, even when you're doing great work and it's amazing momentum for my kingdom, it's awesome, way to go, you're doing it. He says, I want you to come away and rest with me because you're not the one saving the world. I can rest because Jesus sufficiently loves the world. It's a lot of words to say this. The solution to our hurriedness is not more time. It's not better strategies. It's not a planner. It's not me. The solution is Jesus. And because Jesus sufficiently loves the world, he loves the world enough. He loves me enough. I can rest. Martin Luther, one of the greatest theologians of all time, had a friend named Philip. And Philip was really stressed out. And his life was falling apart. Dealing with what I think a lot of us deal with, anxiety. Martin Luther said to his friend Philip, let Philip cease to rule the world. How many of us are living like we have to rule the world? You don't have to. You get to rest with your Savior. Go ahead and see how he does things. The God who knew when it was time to get away, who knew when it was time to rest, and still had time to save the world. Never hurried. Rest with that Jesus. He loves the world enough. He loves you enough. He is the solution. All right, enjoy your discussion together. It's uh, really wonderful to visit with one another. I hope you continue to enjoy this book.